kitten. Dance, dance, dance. Keep your bones hopping. Hop. PBS Kids brings the fun. This is fun. This is fun. This is so fun. <laughs> so funny. And it doesn't have to stop. Yes, yes. Getting dirty is noble and fun. After school. That was fun. After dinner. Ooh, fun. That's kind of fun. Hooray! The fun never stops on PBS Kids. To find out where you can watch PBS Kids on West Virginia Public Broadcasting, visit our website at wvpublic.org. You are watching West Virginia Public Broadcasting. From West Virginia Public Broadcasting. Support for the legislature today is provided by West Virginia University, a land-grant, space-grant, R1 research institution. Learn more at wvu.edu. Good evening, I'm Suzanne Higgins. It's crossover day at the legislature. We'll talk about just what that means in a moment. But first, lawmakers remembered the significance of this day in state history 48 years ago today. The Buffalo Creek disaster, when a piston, piston coal slurry impoundment dam burst, flooding the Logan County Valley below it with black wastewater. We'll hear remarks on the resulting death and destruction by Senator Ron Stallings of Boone County and then Senator Paul Hardesty of Logan. 125 people died, men, women, and children. Entire families were wiped out. There were 1,100 people injured and 4,000 Logan Countyans left homeless. The pictures were horrific. We knew something out of the ordinary and catastrophic had occurred. And what had occurred was a 15 to 20 foot wall of water and debris came rolling down Buffalo Creek. 17 communities, 17 little coal camp communities along Buffalo Creek were decimated. And that was uh, February 26, 1972, and both of those gentlemen were there on that day. Joining me now to discuss what crossover day means are uh, Dave Mistich and Emily Allen. Welcome to the program. Um, Dave, day 50, crossover day, the last day to consider a bill on third reading in its house of origin, a flurry of activity here today. That's right, over in the Senate, uh, today there were like 60 some bills I believe over the house there were nearly just as many um, enough to last us from 9 to 3 30 on the hours floor. long right mm -hmm. right so floor sessions have been really really long the Senate of course uh, been working for a while taking breaks here and there um, got to a, a slew of different things they dealt with uh, pay raises for certain county employees uh, medical cannabis um, uh, you know uh, all, I mean, you name it, it was on the docket today. Uh, it, it's, it's, it's kind of overwhelming if you think about the number Dozens of things. Dozens of right. bills were, were voted on, and, and many of them had, uh, many of them had uh, amendments as well on second reading. That's right. And there were also some bills that, had, uh, that were bumped to third reading that, that had amendments, for one being the cannabis bill that I mentioned, Senate Bill 752. Um, you know, like, uh, th th there was a proposal that would have limited, um, excluded, public officials uh, from uh, taking part within the industry. As we come to find out, there's also some already some provisions in that bill that deal with that. Um, that's an issue that we've been watching for years, of course. But the, the, big, the big question is, is, is leadership getting the bills out of committee that they want to be getting out, or, uh, or out of the chamber that they want to be getting out? Um, I spoke to Senate President Mitch Carmichael today. Of course, over the past couple of days, he's had, yesterday actually had a big loss with Senate Joint Resolution 9 going down. It was a Greyhound bill uh, last week. So I wanted to know, you know, how, how do you feel about things? And here's what Senate President Mitch Carmichael had to say about Crossover Day and where things stand. 
Well, we've gotten a lot accomplished. We can always do more. As one approaches these sessions, you always think there are so many things that the people of West Virginia need, want, and deserve that you try to push through the system and uh, you know always accommodate all the viewpoints that we can. But at the end of the day, we're, we're getting the people's work accomplished. Uh, we'd like to do more, but uh, you know it's uh, you can only move as fast as the entire body is willing to go. And as you heard from there, you know we can only move move as fast as the body allows us to, and you know. That's, that's definitely been, you know, with this deadline and everything that's been, you know, backed up into the queue, uh, there's been things that have held things up. Um, but, you know, so many bills coming over on this last day, this day 50. Uh, and then, of course, uh, we'll see if those bills make it to a committee and to the House floor and vice versa, you know, from the House to the Senate. Um, you know, a lot of times bills become a priority in one chamber and not so much the other. Uh, we'll find out what priorities for the other coming up, so. All right, Emily, um, same thing over in, in the House, of course, 100 members, and so everything goes a little more slowly there, uh, a lot more uh, remarks on the floor or, or comments, questions. Tell us, uh, tell, you started early at 9 o'clock. You know, they didn't start exactly at 9, but yeah, we were here. Um, it, just a lot of the bills on third reading. Um, obviously, it seemed like today everybody wanted to talk about everything, but it kind of seems like in some ways they saved some of the more um, talkative bills for last, for the end. One bill we did notice that didn't make it to the readings today that um, was scheduled as of last night, the email that we tend to get from the House Communications Director was House Bill 4905 from Delegate Sammy Brown, the ban the box bill. That was actually in uh, rules this morning, rescheduled to uh, the House, it was taken off the House calendar. So that bill is effectively dead. Um, I think that was one of the only ones that we've been covering that was removed. What and would I should, that have done? Yes, um, it's kind of a, a trendy name, so I forget that there's a, you know, action associated with it. Um, it would have barred it, public employers, not private public employers, from asking um, certain applicants about their criminal records before granting them an interview. Obviously they can after that, or if the uh, applicant wants to sign a waiver allowing them, they could. Um, so that bill would have done that. There are like 30 other states that are enacting something like that now or have already. Um, West Virginia, I guess, won't be one this session though. Okay, and another bill um, in, in, in rela related in that it's in that, you know, second chance kind of umbrella, uh, 4958, eliminating the ability of a person's driver's license to be suspended for failure to pay uh, court costs and fees. There was, there was a, that went on, those remarks went on for quite a while. Oh, definitely, yeah, and there was a huge robust conversation about this in the House Judiciary Committee. Uh, this bill is from Delegate uh, Danny Hamrick, He's a Republican. Um, and really, it addresses, um, we've been talking about criminal justice reform for a long time, substance use disorder. Something that always comes up is, you know, people want to get jobs once they're, um, you know, re-entering society or they're, you know, recovering, but transportation is a huge barrier. So this bill kind of tries to address that. It sets up a payment plan um, for people who might not be able to make all their fees associated with getting their license back. Um, you know, some of the complaints have been from the, the Democratic side of it is that it still kind of, you know, I think Delegate McBate said, yesterday when proposing amendments, it puts them in like a debtor's prison because it's a payment plan and interest adds up with that. Um, but really the argument in response to that has been that you can't just forgive all this debt. That'd be a huge cost to the state. You know, so many agencies involved like the DMV. Um, so the bill did pass kind of as it was today. Yeah, it, it passed pretty mm -hmm. much overwhelmingly. Because ultimately it's something 89 to 9. For. Yeah. yeah. Okay. But just that the payment plan aspect of it and the interest were kind of the hangups. All righty. And Dave, we, we were just listening to Senate Finance. They took up the the budget, right. uh, their their uh, committee's budget. Tell us what uh, tell well, us what we were able to glean. It was uh, a very quick. quick and meeting. we got this from before, you know, Senator uh, Senators went to that committee. We we found out that there's about a forty nine million dollar difference between the governor's proposed budget and what the Senate Finance Committee is going to propose. Um, the way I understand it, there were no amendments. Mm -hmm. The bill passed right out of committee and is moving right along. Um, very quick. Uh, we rarely see things with a, uh, see a budget bill move that quickly. So, you know, whenever it goes to the floor and beyond, we'll see um, if there's more to it or if they keep it intact the way it is. We've got a lot to look into with that. So. All right. Dave Mistich, Emily Allen, thank you both. Yep. One of those bills just making it out of the Senate safely this morning was Senate Bill 648, 
which will offer, would offer, dental treatment to adult Medicaid recipients. Before that vote, I talked with the chair of the Senate Health and Human Resources Committee, Senator Mike Maroney, Republican of Marshall County, and longtime committee member, Senator Ron Stallings, Democrat from Boone County. We spoke about this bill and many other health initiatives this session. Senators, thank you both for joining me today on such a busy day. We really appreciate it. You have both told me that you are delighted with a bill that came out of your committee, and this is a, um, a bill that would expand dental treatment for uh, Medicaid recipients. Senator Moroni, let's start with you. What, what does this bill do? Well, <clears throat> and I'd like to apologize for my voice. It's actually better today than it's been. But this bill, it is, it is a very important bill. In my four years, it might be the best public health bill that's ever come out of here. Uh, it's, it's a bill that allows those with Medicaid over the age of 21 to have dental care, uh, both preventative and restorative dental care. <clears throat> that can go a long way in helping these patients, uh, you know, with not only just overall health, because the oral health is related to your general body health, but also uh, workforce participation. Just it, it just spins off into every every part of, the, of their life and, and the state's productivity and uh, this bill to me would be transformative if we can get it through the house and the governor sign it across the finish line and if the funding source comes through. Uh, Senator Stallings, I know that uh, you were talking to me about this impacting every aspect of, of a person's life. Yes, uh, from a societal standpoint, uh, again we provide coverage up until you're 21 and then at that magic number of 21, then the only thing you could have from an oral health standpoint were extractions. So uh, with our demographics, uh, we certainly uh, needed this bill. It helps in uh, nursing home situations as well. Most of these folks uh, have uh, Medicaid. Uh, and again, the, the reason we were able to get it through was we capped it at $1,000 per year. That's, that way the fiscal note's not really crazy. I think we would spend about $11 million of West Virginia money, and of course that's matched, about half of the money's matched with nine to one match because that's expanded Medicaid population, okay? And the other half is the, th the traditional three to one match. So this is a great deal for West Virginia. It's an economic development driver. Uh, it helps, uh, you know, <coughs> dentists hire more dental hygienists, uh, et cetera. So, yeah, it, it helps with drug recovery, uh, reintegration into the workforce. So most of the folks that, uh, a lot of the folks that have uh, substance use disorder also have uh, poor oral health. This is just another great tool in the toolbox. Now, uh, I had hoped with our Medicaid surplus that we could just simply expand it. But the Finance Committee put in a proviso that basically says as long as the managed care organization provider tax goes through and it's already out of our our uh, you know out, it's, it's, at, it's at the uh, house right now the Medicaid uh, care the the managed care provider tax yes yeah. MCO about? provider tax they wanted it it provides another 200 million state dollars that again can be matched either nine to one or three to one which again can help keep our hospitals open, can k help keep physician offices open, et cetera. So it's a, uh, it's, it's a good deal. The other thing that is, that is uh, pending is the IDD waiver expansion is contingent on the MCO uh, provider tax making it all the way through. So it's a funding stream for very important Medicaid uh, uh, services. And it's over in the house now. Yeah. Well, we do, we do that tax every year. And I think that, and again, my voice is weak, and I apologize, that uh, it's a tax. And the reason we do that tax is to maximize state dollars. So we tax the MCOs. We, we get extra money. That money gets federally matched. The MCOs get, get it back in reimbursements, and the state gets more money to spend on its people. And, <clears throat> you know, so every year this goes through, and I think that's last year's is coming through. It's, this is all, all has to be approved by CMS. It's not a slam dunk. Just because you do it, you don't get the money. So if, uh, if it comes through, and, and I, I think, it's my understanding that it might be coming through from last year. So I think, I think this is, is gonna happen. And I also think that 
uh, when we had to tie it to that on the finance committee because if we didn't tie it to that tax on the finance committee, the bill would still be sitting in the finance committee uh, and it wouldn't, it wouldn't have been voted on on the floor, it would have died. And we need to get this bill through. Uh, there's 300,000 people in West Virginia that are over 21 on Medicaid and as Senator Stallings pointed out, half of those are regular and half are in the expansion population with a three to one, nine to one matches. It's a blended match of six to one. So this $11 million of state investment will bring in about $51 million of federal money for an overall $62 million that's given to providers in West Virginia, spent in West Virginia. Those dollars are circulating around West Virginia's economy. And overall, this $11 million is an investment. It's not an expense because we're going to save more than $11 million. We're going to get money back in tax revenue. The money's going to be working. And we're also going to save money on the back end with prevention. So it's a, uh, it's kind of, I always, on the, in the committee, I said it's like buying a house versus renting a house. And, and unfortunately, we rent too much around here. But, you know, when you buy a house, you spend a little bit more the first few years. You don't have as much money the first few years. But in the long run, you have a lot more. And that's what this bill is going to do. Um, when comparing your work this year to last year, Senator Stallings, you said that last year you were playing offense with a lot of original bills. This year, the, the committee has been playing defense. I'm going to give your voice a, 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 a Sorry, break good, for good just good a moment. Senator Stallings, why, why don't you begin with that question? What have you had to defend this, this session? Well, I, I hope we're not backwards because, you know, we, we always get these bills that uh, want to undo vaccines. Uh, that's an anti-public health uh, issue uh, and it just sucks the wind if you would out of out of everything it takes a lot of uh, again just not able to uh, do anything good so this year I mean you know last year there was some some uh, you know the teacher issues teacher issues were you know just kind of complicating a lot taking time away from the health committee meetings and things like that so this year you know we talked about I think some pretty good well, stuff the oral health the, uh, you know, the contraception that's important uh, to prevent these unplanned pregnancies, the tubal ligation <clears throat> bill, uh, the oral health bill. Uh, so I think this year, actually, we've had a little bit more breathing room. Now we are, you know, last year was a foster care crisis. Now we're gonna, we're, obviously we're gonna be doing some more things with the foster care. I think the house kind of uh, took the lead on that this year. So we'll be seeing some more uh, foster care and, and uh, things like that. Senator Maroney, um, it, it, the same question to you. What have you had to defend? Well, we all, we, there's always defense, but, um, and, you know, as a committee and as a chair, but also as a committee, because I use, uh, I take Ron. Ron's in a different party than I am, but I listen to Ron as much as I listen to anybody on my committee, and we listen to everybody. But the, the, you, you want to put through good bills and, and come up with new ideas, but you also want to get rid of the bad ideas that have passed before and prevent the bad ideas that have never passed from passing the first time. Ron hit it, the vaccine bills would be, would be terrible. I mean, right now, and, it's, and you know, every year we're down here talking about vaccines, and I don't think there's been a year down here where we haven't been, had some kind of world crisis with a virus. Right now, people are wishing there was a coronavirus vaccine, and they're gonna be, there'll be one here soon. And they're, they're, you know, the smartest people in the world are working on it right now. And, and so why would we want to talk about getting rid of other vaccines? It makes, that makes no sense. Uh, there's a, uh, there's other bills, uh, let me think about this. We, we, I'll, I'll, I'll throw something out to you. You both have uh, listened to a colleague of yours uh, in the Senate um, three or four times in the last week uh, uh, criticize the state's uh, harm reduction program, the needle exchange programs. Um, at, you two are both physicians. Uh, your thoughts on that as, as we try to address the substance use disorder crisis that we have in this state? Well, we, we need to listen to our public health people. They, they get it right. The folks in Huntington are getting it right. Uh, you can't have, uh, you know, a discarded needles be the driving force because there's a lot of places that have no harm reduction program that have discarded needles. <laughs> now, that being said, uh, you know, again, uh, it, the, we can always do things better. And I think uh, the chairman uh, has talked with uh, Secretary Crouch about that. And so they are going to try to, uh, beef up our harm reduction programs, but we absolutely have to have them. Otherwise, we're going to have rampant uh, HIV and Hep C. That's that's a local control issue, 
and no county is required to have a needle con a harm reduction program or needle syringe exchange program, whatever you want to call it, but you're allowed if you want. Uh, do you support? I do, absolutely, and so does the Surgeon General of the United States and the CDC and every public health official I've ever talked to. Uh, the, uh, they're, they're good programs for a lot of reasons. It's not just prevention of infectious disease. It's linked to, linked to rehab, linked to long-term contraception, potentially, which would decrease neonatal abstinence syndrome, potentially. Uh, so there's a lot of good reasons for them. Uh, but here's the problem. Well, Charleston's a good example. Charleston had two programs. One wasn't doing very well, and one was. One's closed down, and one isn't. Uh, they have the ability to do that. Every local government can do that on their own if they don't like it. Um, with that being said, there's a, a few senators uh, and one in particular that, that did a really good job on this this year and, and, and as far as bringing to light the issue of a needle litter. We do have a needle litter problem. There's no question we have a needle litter problem, but that's not a reason to get rid of the harm reduction programs. So instead of running a bill to, to get rid of these programs, which would not be the ideal thing to do, we're going to, we went to... And there is a bill. Not anymore. Uh, <laughs> and, 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 we, and we went to Secretary Crouch and, and, and here's what's going to happen. So, there, so there's going to be loose central control, uh, and he, he's promised us this, and he's going to report to the senators about this. And the central control is going to have DHHR is going to develop a needle litter program and tie it to grant funding. So it's tied to the money it works. Uh, and all these harm reduction programs will adopt their needle litter program or they won't get funding. And uh, that's the way it's going to work. And he's in, in, in developing that needle, or, uh, that needle litter program, he's going to be... Um, in contact with the senators that are involved, uh, the ones that have taken the lead on this, all and you know who they all are, and to develop that over this next year, and hopefully that'll work. If it doesn't work, we'll readdress it next year uh, because we want to keep the programs intact and functioning, but we want to get the needles off the ground. All right, I'm, I'm going to start with you now. Uh, the next question, uh, Senator Maroney, you both have been absolutely passionate in your crusade against uh, youth tobacco use. Uh, now we have vaping. Has anything come from your committee on that? Well, yeah, and, and no, but we want, I wanted to. Vaping, um, something for vaping was one of my uh, biggest um, priorities this session. We didn't, we didn't do it, but uh, and how, do you, how do you stop vaping? How do you decrease cigarette use? Is you raise the taxes on them. That's how you stop it. Mm -hmm. You can't make it illegal, so you raise the taxes on it. Um, we had a um, significant vape tax uh, increase that was tied to a bill that died yesterday. That was that business inventory tax. Uh, and I'm not sure if there's going to be something coming over from the House that we can stick that in or not. But, but getting rid of that, uh, this, 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 we all know what cigarettes do to public health. And, and, and it's, in my opinion, it's okay to tax them more because they drain dollars from our state dollars because they use more state dollars. So they're taking money away from other programs because they're choosing to smoke. And that's okay. That's their right. But it's, you know, you got to pay a little bit extra for that. Uh, the vaping, we, this, the majority leader talked yesterday on the floor about uh, we had a, a double lung transplant in a teenager in this state uh, because of a, a vaping. His lungs were like just gelatin when the surgeon got in there. He said he's never seen anything like it. He said the surgeon, this is a paraphrase, I can't remember exactly what the majority leader said, but he said uh, the surgeon said he's been doing this for 30 years and this is an evil like no other he's ever seen. Uh, is what that, what that vaping did to this, this poor little kid's lungs. So we, that will be addressed. If it doesn't get across the finish line, you can count on it next year. It'll be a priority. And next year, I'm not going to let it get out of my hands. I'm going to make sure it gets across the finish line. Um, Senator Stallings, uh, in, in the interest of our, our waning time here, you mentioned um, our, our need to um, help our, our small hospitals. And we know just recently Fairmont uh, Regional's announcement of their pending closure. Don't we know by now what, uh, how to, to secure uh, our, our small hospitals? Well, again, a lot of our small hospitals are critical access hospitals. They get cost-based reimbursement. They're okay for the most part. <coughs> uh, the folks that are not getting some type of enhanced compensation are the ones that are in trouble largely because of our payer mix. 1.1 million have government pay insurance, which pays less than uh, sometimes the cost of delivering the service. With our pay for uh, uh, service, uh, you know, pay, uh, we're gonna, the whole payment system is gonna be changing before long. Uh, and uh, again, the idea is to 
uh, right now, I think, since we have a Medicaid surplus, is to enhance the uh, Medicaid reimbursement a little from 32 cents on the dollar to, uh, you know, something like 36, on, 36 cents on the dollar, and that can save these hospitals. Maybe not put uh, as much into that Medicaid Family First Fund, uh, the $150 million uh, rainy day fund that the governor is proposing? Well, that's, you know, again, I tried to clear it up yesterday during the question and answer with the chairman. He says that money will be used and draw down Medicaid match. So if you want to save a little bit, that's okay with me. But uh, again, that still leaves us with uh, over $150 million in surplus, which could pay down the oral health component and the IDD waiver component and still have some left over. Yeah. Uh, and if the M MCO tax continues, uh, again, we've had a hospital tax, but I think the MCO tax might be relatively new, and that's new money, $200 million, uh, hopefully per year. All right. It's also been a great year for pharmacists. Their, their scope of practice, I think, is, is better. They can be billing for services. And again, prescription drug costs, we're trying to address that. I know we don't have much time. Okay, that, that'll have to be your last word, Senator, uh, Senator Maroney. Yeah, is, uh, uh, I agree with uh, the Senator. The, um, as far as that, uh, the fund that we created, that, that money should be used for Medicaid. Otherwise, we're giving away a lot of federal matching dollars. I think that's very important. <clears throat> Now, as far as the hospital closures go, uh, he, th there's obviously, it's hard for hospitals to exist today, but it's possible. Uh, the, the, two, the mo two most recent that closed were OVMC and Fairmont. You, you got to look at the company involved because it was the same company that bought these hospitals, took them from nonprofit status to for profit status. They have a track record. It's not super clean. Uh, I don't know the details. I'm not accusing anybody of anything, but there's, there's more involved there than, than, than we know um, superficially here. And... Uh, but we, we, need to, we need to look at the situations closely because we don't want that to repeat itself a third time. All right, Senator Michael Maroney, Republican of Marshall County, Chair of the Senate Health and Human Resources Committee, and Senator Ron Stallings, Democrat of Boone County, longtime member of the Senate Health Committee. Thank you both. Thank you, Mr. Our pleasure. Tomorrow in the legislature today, it's Arts Day at the Capitol. We'll cover all the activity as well as get an update on the budget and several other major bills. I'm Suzanne Higgins for everyone here at West Virginia Public Broadcasting. Thanks for joining us. Have a great evening. Viewers report their opinion of an organization is more positive when they find out it supports West Virginia Public Broadcasting. To enhance your organization's credibility, call our community support staff, 304-556-4930. Vast, frozen, barren. This is no place to be a lone wolf. Here, prey are fierce and five times your size. But the biggest challenge of all, your competition. To succeed, you need family, a pack, where the bonds of love and loyalty are strong. Because here, strength in numbers is the only way to survive. Join us tonight at 8 p.m on expedition. I'm with an expert team pushing deep into South America's pristine jungle. <laughs> it's the middle of nowhere. To find a lost world never before seen by human eyes. What do you think? We're completely on our own. It looks pretty intimidating. Watch your room. It's incredible. These places are absolute treasures and we have to do everything we can to protect them. We came here looking for lost worlds. We found one. Join us tonight at 10 p.m. West Virginia Public Broadcasting, made possible by you since 1969. I've been with the organization almost 20 years. I started off as a production associate, and I've worked with the organization in many different facets, directing, I've spent time doing audio, doing video, doing editing, 
Nothing brings you more pleasure than to see something you spent time and energy working on. Make it into the homes of West Virginians who want to know their arts, culture, and history. It's an interesting group of people working here at West Virginia Public Broadcasting, both on radio and video production side of things. It takes a certain person to be able to learn the art of bringing you great quality programs. Now as your executive director of West Virginia Public Broadcasting,